I just tried not to. Hey, you guys. Hi, Ren. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> so, uh, welcome. Thanks for coming today to the National Community Plan Steering Committee's uh, second hybrid meeting. So, we have our Zoom going and we have live audience here at the Nesco Beach uh, Golf Course Clubhouse. And thanks to the golf course for, and Missy for, for uh, hosting us for these meetings. Uh, we will uh, we'll start out, I'll start out by introducing the members of the committee who are here. Lori Kovac, hi. Colin C. Hi. Oh, are, you're on, are you on both? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the secretary. I'm not on any of the committee. Okay, and Jeff is secretary of the. Um, I'm trying to think. NCAC. Of, NCAC. He's the NCA. Right, NCAC secretary <laughs> does 50 million things, so I can't remember all the what titles. Just uh, our secretary and. Um, for and Lynn is here on Zoom. Oh, and there, look at all those folks. And Lynn's, I, I knew that. <laughs> There's somebody else in the room, but yes, she's on the screen, Linda Saxton. And Guy Siebert is not here today. Um, we also have Sarah Absher here today from the uh, Department of Community Development, uh, Tilma County. And we're grateful for her uh, help in this process. Uh, I'll turn it over to Tom, who will start uh, today's proceedings. Okay, welcome. Uh, one of the things I'd like to ask you to do that we didn't do last time is when you have a comment that you could identify yourself at least the first time because the people on the uh, screen can't necessarily see great resolution to know who it is. So you don't have names floating in front of you, so it's a little bit easier that way. So last time what we did was we started going down with the, the uh, vision statement from the previous edition of the document. Uh, I, I think we should continue that, but given time, we should also do some free association. And you just might just think about what you, when you have the concept of nestling in your mind, what's the, what's a word that you're thinking of? What what what's a feeling? We're all talking about values here, so it's, it's not something that you want done. It's some it's some way that you value what's here. So we're thinking on that, and then we'll go through this list. Oh, okay. So, any questions? And and if you're quiet, then I'm going to get very nervous. Now, like, okay. So, <laughs> oh, no, no, but I, I hate to identify them as a joke. So, if you can chuckle, that's also a great. Okay. So, we went through the first rule bullets. Uh, I'll just. Okay. Just say if you're on the Zoom and you want to talk, would you put in the meeting chat that you'd like to say something? And Jeff's gonna watch it, and yeah. then you'll be able to join in when you want to. Sorry. Very <laughs> good. I think we got the logistics. Yes. Okay, fair enough. So, what we uh, do you all have to hand out, or did you? It's right there by the door. There's a thing to take. Anyone? Without thing to or you could maybe explain to them what's on the uh, generally what's on the handout since they don't. Oh, have sorry. Uh, the handout is a list of the um, all the current values in the Nest Wind plan, and then there's also a summary of the meeting time, the next meeting times, and those are on the NCAC website. So you can always find those right there, but we can go over those at the end of the meeting. Okay, perfect. And uh, just to give you some background on, on where it is that I would like us to go, uh, I'm in the process of taking apart the current uh, vision and putting it into pieces similar to the way that we did with the bylaws, except instead of being a nine page document, this is a 60 some page document. Uh, it has a lot of history, a lot of good information. Uh, we don't lose that, but it kind of gets in the way of what the document is about. Uh, Sarah, you were going to talk to us again about what, the, what our limits are, what our goals. Okay, thank you. 
I'm going to try to replicate that. And I yeah, think that's good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Tom. So um, Wednesday, I given just uh, a not so brief overview of kind of what we're doing in the relationship of, of this work with the community plan. The task and the exercise that is before the community today will establish the vision and values that serve as the baseline and the framework as we start working on policies in the community plan that um, inform both um, decision makers like myself, the planning commission, the board of county commissioners, and the community as to how you would like to see Nesco and grow and develop over the next 20 years. It's your priorities, those policies then carry through into your implementing ordinances. So the ordinances that we use for your residential zoning districts and your commercial zoning district that talk about what building heights should be and setbacks and allowable uses, um, lot coverage for open space, all of those pieces that fold into your zoning permits and your land use applications come from the policies. Like, so when we talk about um, a policy is that Nestlein shall maintain skinny streets, right? What happens is, is then when I go to the ordinances and that's what I use to review development proposals, and you say you want narrow driveway connection widths to lots and you would prefer your roads to be 14 feet wide. That, that, those regulations, those ordinances came from the policy. Does that make sense to everybody? So the value and vision is, you know, like um, the first one, a place where safety, adequate utility services and essential pedestrian streets are priorities. That's your value. The policy then becomes, we would like narrow skinny streets and we want development for our multimodal pedestrian paths that provide connectivity throughout the community. That's the policy. The ordinance, which then becomes the regulation is, streets shall be no more than 14 feet wide, driveway connection units shall be no more than 12 feet wide. So that's how it all threads together through this process. So um, in working in this first piece, this is the baseline. We have multiple tasks as part of this process um, and not, not to overwhelm folks with the laundry list of what all of those are going to be over the next six-ish months. That's where we're starting today. So when we look at our values and the vision, it's really important that we talk about what those are and what those words mean to us as people because safety means different things to different people. So in support of POMS, facilitation today, just really think about when we talk about safety, we all in our minds can think about what that means, but our what matters to us as safety may not be what matters to our neighbor. So your input is really, really important. Um, as far as the process goes, we're going to work on this first important step and several along the way. Um, the work that the committee is doing that I'm doing with the committee, so my role in all of this is to make sure that as we work through uh, updating the community plan, that we are staying within the framework of the land use program, right? So um, eventually these that vision and values that become policies that look at ordinances and other regulatory implementation, my role is going to be to help guide the process to make sure that we are staying on the path of what is supposed to be land use. This process becomes very legalistic once we take the final product through hearings. So once this committee work is done, then I actually shepherd this document, which will be living and breathing until the board makes a final decision, meaning the board of county commissioners. We will notice public hearings. We will go through the planning commission. So Guy Siever, as you know, is one of the representatives of the planning commission. They will make a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners eventually to approve and adopt these updates. That's what we're hoping for. So our goal is consensus to get these updates done to where we can get this through a smooth hearings process and adoption and not have to worry about appeals at the state level. Does that make sense to everybody? I think that was a lot shorter than this. 
We will show. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. All right. Yeah. And we'll talk about that more as the process okay. goes on, but that's the overview. So my job as the editor of this document is to try to present a clear and concise flow from the values to the goals. I'll get you back in a second. That the policies which will hopefully result in ordinances. So it's going to be a flow process, and we're at the very beginning. Uh, the document's primary purpose is land use, and it's land use within uh, the uh, community boundary. Uh, however, I don't believe that we are limited in terms of our values as to what we put down. Now, they may or may not have had to evolve, and that's our thing. So we want to elicit as much input as we can. We may be able to find that actually some value we didn't think about does apply. But to each one of the values, each one of the goals, we have to relate the value. So if we don't have it as a value, it can't be a goal. If it's not a goal, it's not going to turn into policy. So it's very important to get as much wide breadth of values going into the process then so that we can make sure that we cover everything. Any questions about that? That's really <laughs> They're paying attention. Oh, okay. well, I mean, I, I really have to say how grateful I am that you're here uh, because it was a gorgeous day. <laughs> and I, I was tempted to tell you Okay, so what we've done is we've gone through the first four and uh, values that are listed in the thing. Uh, I don't think we should probably spend time on those. We should go on and uh, progress from that. And if you're curious about our conversations, there's a video. Uh, so right now we're in the, uh, the, the thing to start the conversation is a village predominantly made up of private residences with a minimum of commercial activity and respect for appropriate construction guidelines. That sounds mildly inflammatory. People's reaction. What do you think of when you think of that? Is that is that aligned with your values or, or not? You, you look like you want to say something. And also okay. sure that you're that. Yeah. Uh, sounds good to me. I'm Tom Bernadich, and sadly, everywhere I go now, uh, Tom Tom C is is uh, chairing these meetings. So in this context, I'm Tom too, and he is Tom one. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you, you said give a word. This is sort of beyond beyond the topic, but uh, I can give four that means something to me. Uh, community and selfless citizens. Uh, that's to me the overarching value that I have, would have to finesse. Any reaction to that? Follow on, agree, or disagree? No one's? Susan Schomburg, civility, which I think goes along with being a selfless citizen. Could you repeat that? Civility. Civility. I don't know how to spell it. C I B I L I T Y. <laughs> and Lori has helped harmless from any grammatical or spelling discrepancies through this process. <laughs> Civility. Civility and neighborliness. Starts with a C. Yeah. <laughs> Civil, I, I got credit for being the editor of bylaws, but Susan's my editor. <laughs> so anyway, uh, reaction to that? So, Susan, sorry. Civility and neighborliness. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is actually people interaction is what is a value. Mm -hmm. Not, not got enough. <laughs> I think this is a good value. I like it. <laughs> is there anything that you would change about it? Maybe the wording, but I think the, the intent and the meaning. What words in there jump out at you that you might uh, want to change? Well, the respect for appropriate construction guidelines is um, they. Oh, yeah. It's all kind of vague. And that, that's part of the thing. Go ahead. And maybe that's that's okay. Appropriate construction guidelines would probably, well, I'm not really sure what, 
what it means in this um, it, 20 years ago. I'm not sure what it meant. Uh, you know, maybe it, maybe there are, um, it probably related to um, kind of county rules or maybe community rules as far as building height and setbacks and, mm -hmm. and different things like that mm -hmm. is what I assume it means. What are, the, what are the values that would be associated with how you see what it means and that you might be more comfortable with? Saying it in a different way? Yeah. I'm not really sure. I, I didn't think about it. Uh, okay. I'm not sure how I would say it differently. Maybe it's okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Frank Schmidt, um, I think I can speak to this because I was here when we were originally doing this. And the construction guidelines had to do with um, not building cell towers to build a town. <laughs> so that was the key thing, I think, that this eventually rolled into so that you wouldn't have, yeah, and gas stations. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that just seems to be tacked on to the back of one that's very solid, in my opinion, in terms of community activity. Mm -hmm. So, and a respect for mm -hmm. appropriation and structure guidelines should be somewhere else completely because within the state, federal, there's enough guidelines everywhere we have to abide by whatever you build anything anyway. It, they have to be reasonable. I'm assuming that I haven't read Hillary County guidelines, but I'm assuming they're already in place and have already been vetted. So are we changed? Is does this mean we have a chance to change just for this one away from something that's already been approved through ordinances well, from the county? That, well, Nesco does have its own land use uh, zoning laws. So I believe that those, you know, those are something subject to our comment at least. So we're just change. speaking of zoning laws here? Uh, primarily, this is a yeah. land use document. Okay. Um, as I said, yeah, I got to open it up more than that because NCAC is about more than just language, but that's primarily what this document is. Construction yeah. guidelines is construction. It doesn't say land use guidelines, it says mm -hmm. construction guidelines. Yeah. Okay. I would not have written these things the way they are. <laughs> and, and, and we get the opportunity to rewrite them. So yes. that's right, the reasons we want to. Yeah. Prompt you to like, what is a better say, way to say what we mean? Like, what, mm -hmm. like, can, can we express the values that we have more? Uh, that can draw things, things like this. Yes. Okay. Right. But, it's, so, uh, there are different guidelines, right? Based on our values that you said last meeting, that, for instance, some of the height yeah. limits and the coastal hazards overlay mm -hmm. and things are were developed here. Mm -hmm. And that, that, like, the height limit and some of the other things are specifically because our plans had this in it mm -hmm. and they were developed specifically for an S1 based on this mm -hmm. this goal or this vision. Land use. Right. Okay. So one of the challenges that Sarah has placed in front of us is to define a village in a village field. If you want to. <laughs> uh, she <laughs> hadn't got a good one yet. So if yeah. you can think of one, <clears throat> either now or later, uh, that would be a really good thing because it is hard to describe exactly what it feels like. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> if we could, that would be a good thing. Well, and I kind of picture with villages and towns and stuff is when you're driving, they're just smaller and and um, not isolated. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, like when you're driving, you're in Europe and you drive and you find a village, it's just a small little cove kind of like we have. So it would be meaning that you wouldn't want to build bigger. So the only way I'd see that is to stop building. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's possible. So to no, keep it a small yeah. building, so, you would have to stop building. Yeah. And so I don't know that, I mean, the definition is of a village is small. The bigger it gets, it turns into a town and then a city. And so to keep it a village, it'd have to be small. So the other yeah. thing to consider is that this is um, this also embraces hills of Escort and South Beach, Hawk mm -hmm. uh, Creek Hills. So in a way, all those places are sub-village areas or other right. villages right. that are 
interacting hopefully more and more. But eventually more. they all become one and then it becomes big. Yeah. So um, yeah, because when I grew up, I grew up in California, we had New Hall, Valencia, Canyon Country and Saugus, and now it's all Santa Cruz City. So eventually those smaller ones become big and become tiny. So in order to keep it a village, you would have to keep it small. Well, we we have a little bit of help from uh, the state in that, and that uh, it's virtually impossible to change our community boundaries of Range to zero. Yeah. So we are defined as a small. Now, yeah. how we develop within that small area is really the, the question. I guess I had a question too: is as it gets bigger, and the fact that people like to come here, mm -hmm. um, temporary or overnight or weekend or six months. Um, how can we avoid getting hotels and motels built in order to accommodate those people that come, especially if there's a cap on short-term rentals? So is it possible to rezone and end up kind of like Lincoln City where we get big because we have a bunch of hotels and motels to accommodate those people? That's beyond my my knowledge base. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So and then it takes away from being a village. So, so to to your point, um, village can be defined many ways. Um, you know, it can be, you know, if you think about it, do building heights, do maximum building footprints, setbacks, all of those things can contribute to talk about how to keep things at a size, maybe it's not the boundary and the growth of the the community as a whole. Maybe what we're talking about is that that village atmosphere is achieved through how you build on a lot. Um, and then to your point about uses, I don't, I got to go back. I'm not sure if the commercial zone allows for motels, hotels. But um, can that change? It can, as the but need grows. It can, but here's here's the tricky part. So when I talked about, you know, kind of helping stay within the framework and being the bumpers of this process, anytime we start act, uh, talking about adding or removing uses in zoning, through the land use system, you start looking at property takings, you start talking about property rights and values of properties, and that will bring us down an entirely different path. I don't or see that, aside from my work with Senate Bill 406 for housing, I don't foresee anything through this process. What's Senate Bill 406? Thank you. Senate Bill 406 is a housing bill that was signed by the governor that will become part of our work to look at our residential zoning districts to add more diverse housing options in your residential zones. How do you define that? Apartments. No, it's a, no, it's a, um, it's it's specific. I have a whole other presentation on this that I'll do at a later date. Um, but it's basically up to four dwelling units outright. So not apartments, not motels, hotels. Um, it's specific to different types of housing that essentially are designed to to address a need for people who want to live and work here. It's not destination resort housing. It's not vacation housing. There are some really like strict limits. Plus. Yeah, like a fourplex potentially, if the lot's big enough, right? Um, because to the point too that Randall had made, you know, it's easy to pull focus of this process into the village proper, I guess I would say, but we have a larger community that we're actually talking about and we need to think about through this process. Um, I wouldn't worry about. I would say upzoning is a common term for additional motel, hotel, transient lodging. I don't foresee that being part of this process. Because it would be a big part. Like we have no cell towers, no gas stations. Mm -hmm. um, how do we incorporate no hotels, motels, and mm -hmm. bigger commercial things? In other words, how can we keep our green spaces yeah. and not have them rezoned up? So what I'm hearing you say is that is a value and part of the vision. Mm -hmm. And that that's when we would look at later on when we look at the order the zoning ordinances, the development standards that are in place. Mm -hmm. If that is how the community as a whole feels, then we need to look at those zoning ordinances to make sure that those values are preserved. Yeah. So that this can this, we legally do that though. 
whether we'll win or not is a different thing. But, you know, we don't want. There's a difference between a want and being able to. I agree. But for the sake of saving all of those really important legal land use conversations to a later date. I think today the focus is let's look at the vision and the values and we're gonna we're gonna save that hard work for the moment where we have to have it. And I hope you're here for it because it'll be good. Well, yeah, writing down what we yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Today. Uh, I think that an expectation is that rolling something back is probably not feasible. Presenting preventing something from progressing from one zone to the next is something that we can have to back. That's that's my understanding. Yes. I know that we have in the village for marshland that's designated federal. Is there a possibility to extend and grow our federal marshland to have green open space? So part of so part of that land is within your community boundary and part of it is outside. So you've got two questions there. You're it's there's expansion of development standards that would push development further away from it, which then does get us in the realm of measure 56 notice and property rights discussions. The other piece of it is working with US Fish and Wildlife and others to take a different approach on that. And we have an owner where I'm at, I'm over on Pulls Rock Loop, I'm south. And so, um, and that's a private area. And so our HOA bought the green space between South Beach and Proposal Rock so that we can keep that without being built and have a, a private kind of cushion. Um, is there a way for our, our area to buy certain areas to keep them undeveloped? Potentially, but I think that all then feeds back to what we're talking about with vision and values. So what I'm hearing is a value is preservation of natural resources and open space. And right. protection right. 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 Okay. We want that. Mm -hmm. It might be it might be good. <laughs> might be good to actually have a map of what's wetland, what's mm -hmm. private, mm -hmm. and will be held mm -hmm. where the residential is, mm -hmm. where the commercial is, and what are those lots that could be developed in a commercial? Well, it turns out that the county is very good at uh, having a map. <laughs> um, if you will. Uh, if you look at the current bylaw, as the current proposed bylaws, there is a note in there of a pointer to that Tillamook County map, and it will give you zoning. Uh, and, and, and we're going to do eventually a land use 101 training mm -hmm. when we prepare for those next series of tasks that start getting into the conversations that we're having this morning. And we will do that before we take a deeper dive into these pieces of municipal and zoning ordinances. But I'd love to give you a primer first to give you the tools that you need so that we can really yeah. have that discussion. Later. Now, I understand yeah. there's only commercial property across the way there. Is that uh, where there used to be the golf course? There is some commercial over there. there. Yeah. There's there's commercial here also. Mm -hmm. you, you go Highway 101 on, on the west side. Um, you know, things can be refurbished, they can evolve, structures get torn down, new uses come in over but time. You can't change the land use zoning district or code or designation without a zone change. That is correct, or a legislative tax amendment. Yes. So, but again, I think that those conversations come back to this first initial step of what are your vision and values for your community? Because when we get to that piece, mm -hmm. we have to have a connection between the work you're doing today to get to that piece later in the future as part of this work. Yeah, my name is Matt Gill. Um, I do have just one comment on somebody mentioned uh, turning over land to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really bad idea because whenever U.S. Fish and Wildlife Required land. The first thing they do is put up no trespassing signs, and that's it. No one can ever walk through that land or use that land ever again. And I experienced that all over Tony County. Mm -hmm. um, the places I used to go on the second day, I can't go anymore because they posted it as a refuge, and that's it. Uh, north of the golf course is all now owned by Federal Fish and Wildlife, so you can't take a canoe up there and go canoeing. 
um, you can't use that land at all. So, so that's well, a slippery slope. A value I just heard then was access to natural areas mm -hmm. is a value. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It. That's, yeah. that's yeah. It's kind of yeah. the same as the height of the water tower. There's there's a height that's up through there and the post closed, you know. <laughs> so yeah. like so they'll, they'll close up access to it. Nancy raised her hand if we were. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I put something in the chat, but I guess it wasn't seen. Um, so back when uh, Tom Prohodic and and Susan were talking, I wanted to just throw out there for those of us in Zoom land that um, in terms of the community spirit and that kind of thing, that I would like to add interaction through a variety of methods in person via Zoom, et cetera, because I think Zoom since 2020 has really added a lot of uh, people being able to interact with community members through through this this method as well as in person. Although I love seeing all of you in person, it's it's a it's a different feel for that. I wish I could be there in person. Hi, Tom. <laughs> we did. Laurie did capture your statement, but it's good to hear it from you directly. Also, thank you. Uh, just to add the idea of village to me, I should say is um, slow speeds, like 15 mile an hour or less. And I don't know what traffic features in this and speed limits, but I just wanted to flag that because I know in the village proper, slow traffic is maintains the village feel. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm trying to, would that be really, what kind of value would you see? Would that is there safety or serenity or? Uh, I think both serenity, safety, slow pace. I think it just slows well, everyone down. And you get to know your neighbors because okay. you're driving and walking more slowly. Ability to drive golf carts is oh. also important in the port, mm -hmm. I should say. So to that, one of the things we talked about the other night was in establishing the values and vision in terms of what you're speaking to, um, especially, you know, multimodal alternative vehicular options mm -hmm. to, you know, to travel through the community. Um, part of these values that become policies uh, Director Chris Lady from Public Works and I and others can use these when we go after grant money through ODOT and others to try to get additional funds to create these types of head paths and, you know, preserving what you're speaking about in the future with improvements. So yeah. just on a personal basis, I would love to have an easy path from South Beach Road into the village. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to make really scared. So, um, yeah. you know, from the other night, addressing what was just said, I a value was a place where the vehicular speed driven is dictated by pedestrians, pets, and bicycles. Cars come last in priority unless they are emergency vehicles. So just kind of a, that, that the slow traffic of us dictates what the speed is, not some speed limit or just driving at any speed to the village. Actually, one, one of the things I really like about the heel of Nesquim is the ways that vehicles and people interact. Okay. And even the way vehicles interact on hot drive up there that's so narrow you can't pass anybody, a lot of when I have to back up and let someone else through, it just feels good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Signaling, I should come get us go. Oh, yeah, I was gonna have to buy Yes, I know. 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 I a village or what is our villages of the interaction among us, which goes back to Tom and Susan's comment at the beginning of um, selfless, selflessness, ability, the caring for each other. Um, I think so much, um, there's a lot of needs here that require volunteers and I don't know 
how this would unfold in terms of goals and and um, policies or getting grants, but because so much volunteering is required for our basic needs here, I wonder if there's something, some way of community support for each other or encouragement mm -hmm. to like bring people out to do what they can or give what they can to support the community yeah. feel. So know. what I'm hearing is that volunteerism is an important value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and okay. what I would add to that, so again, part of this for me is how can I roll this into not only zoning, but when we're looking at grants, when we're looking at funding or ways to ask for help for projects that are important to the community, a lot of what can make leveraging those grants or those resources um, is the in-kind work, right? It's the commitment to, to help and, and it's the people resources. So to what you're saying, I think that's very relevant because we can use that to say there's a dedicated group of members of this community that will come and provide the work and the support that needs to get it done. So I, I think that's fabulous. So to that end, if you want to see a whole bunch of people volunteering, it's Memorial Day weekend, mm -hmm. where we have all the activity, we have the burn pile going, which will hopefully, we do see a mount or a yard degree throughout the area, the time of heading up the burn pile. <laughs> bring your yard debris to the burn pile to pay us money. <laughs> because we've seen those those major fires go through all these areas and we need to keep everything down. Second to that is, and it's clear in the very first balance statement, is essential pedestrian streets are priorities. So backing up a little bit, how do we take care of all these potholes in all the gravel streets that we have? We're, we're not going to go buy a whole bunch of dump truck full of gravel. We do. <laughs> we have as well. Mount Angel is your next dump truck load. Oh. So, <laughs> so, I mean, we can, but... We're, we're not seeing anything from the county that they care about our streets. Uh -huh. And within, you know, the responsibility of Tillamook County is making sure our streets are safe. And they're not. It's a big discussion. Yeah, it's a big discussion. That's slowing it down. Anyway, yeah, I call it reverse people. I'm sure, sir, I'd love to say that the uh, county only has so much money and lots of infrastructure things have gone wrong this year. That, and if you listen to the meeting from the other night that Jeff is going to put on the website, we had a very long conversation about this, so I encourage you to listen. One of the things that I took away from Wednesday too with all of these conversations, I am gonna see if I can get Director Chris Lady here for one of these meetings because the transportation piece of these community plan updates is really important. And I, I think it would be good from, for him to hear from all of you too. But go back to Wednesday night, it was a good discussion. Right, in the past, um, there's been a group of volunteers that goes around once a year and patches the potholes in the asphalt streets. Oh, uh, and I believe Toronto County provides the asphalt. They do. And the rest of us are the rest of the school provides the asphalt. So some of that does get done. Yeah, my favorite. Song. Yeah, my yeah. favorite. Yes. Right? Yeah, with what families do now? Yeah. Right. There you go. Yeah. So, Sarah, so the ground you mentioned um, different yeah. infrastructures. Uh, yeah. well, we all have the wash out. Okay. Out. okay. 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 Uh, so, any other? Uh, let's let's go on to the next one. I think we've, we've got that one pretty good. Uh, this really kind of speaks to the public place. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and hey, please. Uh, we we got to have Dana. We, we kind of have to moderate that. Cause yeah. Because that's yeah, you guys are right next to the microphone. Right next to the microphone. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so let's go on to the next one. A place for community spirit and friendly atmosphere, yet also has respect for individual privacy. It's sort of we covered that a little bit. Is there anything that that creates in terms of values for people? In better way to stay there. 
uh, the community spirit really uh, the people who do the power repair. Uh, that's part of community spirit and volunteerism. Anyone can add to that. You can come to that. I trust people up and they really do. <laughs> <laughs> Anything there at all? So Tom, I can I can maybe give that a little context. Yeah. Okay. So when we talk about respect for individual privacy, any thoughts of how that trickles into your zoning ordinances from this value? Noise ordinances mm -hmm. is what I think. Okay. Light pollution. Light. Okay. So noise, and we're gonna. We're going to put that in the parking lot, Susan, because I got a whole other piece of that at some point I'll share too. Um, so lighting, okay, what else? How about setbacks, right? You can't build your houses right next to each other if it's new construction. A lot of you guys have older homes here and I'm not sure where the property markers were, but it's okay um, when those cottages were built. But do you think setbacks help with the privacy? I, I think setbacks don't really help as much with privacy as uh, a limit on population does. Right. I think, uh, you know, and this, I don't want to start this whole thing mm -hmm. about SDRs, but sure. that's, that's a huge part of limiting our privacy. What about vegetation maintenance, like trees and... You know, do you think trees and, and vegetation, landscaping helps with privacy? Yeah, yeah, it does, but I think you have to balance it with fire hazard risks. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parking, like if someone's mm -hmm. driveway or like an extra spot. Mm -hmm. fire mm -hmm. here. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about privacy, and again, we weed that value into the land use program. Those are the things that I think about too. Fences. Fences. Mm -hmm. Although I want to tell you in my career, I've never told any customer that fences make good neighbors. I'm going to put that on the record. <laughs> Although there are some community members who, who do feel that. Not good, but just But I mean, yeah, so when we talk about individual privacy, um, the community spirit and friendly atmosphere, I think that that's a value. I don't know how to put that into land use, but when we talk about if individual privacy is important to you, think about how we can achieve that. Does, does anyone have any thoughts on ring cameras and that kind of thing? About what? Ring cameras, like, like, ring. Like, like where you might walk in front of someone's house and be mm -hmm. captured sure. like, yeah, sure. yeah. or Or you see the bears. <laughs> Bears came up a lot last there, time. There too. Bear cans. Yeah. Yeah, bears don't have any respect for individuals. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to. That's right. Okay, anything else? On? Okay. Something I'd like to like comment off of the noise mm -hmm. Is if there's a way we can maybe not do fireworks here in this one, but like put that, that, that down because one, it's it's awful for you know our animals that we have. It's awful for the wildlife where mothers leave their babies. It's all over, left all over the beach that goes into the ocean, and I just don't see the reason to always have it. And it's a possible fire hazard. And a possible fire hazard. I, I think that was brought up. I'm not sure we got through that, but I think that's, that's a value. That's, a, that's, that's kind of uh, the value of not having that. Yeah, I say, yeah. A point of contention. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know I, I have noticed, I live in South Beach, and um, when the community had the fireworks, there was less spontaneous firework activity because it was controlled. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, I think based on last 4th of July, I'm gonna go away. Um, <laughs> but um, there was, so it's a, it's not, it can be a value, but it really is an enforcement issue. And so a lot of people at South Beach brought their own fireworks because there wasn't a community display. Mm -hmm. Do you, pardon me? Mm -hmm. 
Historically, that's not true. I don't think. Historically, and, okay. I'm just taking a snapshot of that. And, and certainly last year, although the the, the established uh, or the quote unquote official display was not on the actual board. Correct. Right. So, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, it will be on the board display this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sure. that is a yeah. So for some people, that's community. Mm -hmm. That like the parade and things like that. That's a more celebration. It's a hard tradition to over. Yeah, yeah. it's a tradition yeah. for some that come out. Yeah. My experience has been that whether or not we have an official display, the fire workers are just wildly out of control. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I just noticed a lot, a lot more trash on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to express it as a value and conflict and 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 finding consensus probably would be very, very, very difficult. But I think the individual fireworks that end up as trash, like probably there's yeah. a lot more consensus about mm -hmm. like values that we could express about like keeping the beaches clean, including right. on the 4th of July, things like that. So, right. the, the, yeah. Again, it's taught to <laughs> the uh, regulated fireworks were fine. And uh, mm -hmm. the fireworks on South Beach were not primarily done by South Beach residents. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that come in and they 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 have they've been doing it for it's a tradition, they've been doing it for a long time, but it really has gotten out of control. It control. I mean, it's I, not limited to the fourth of July. It goes on to me. It's awful. And yeah, it's awful. they can give you a firework. Like, you don't need to be lighting shit out of the car. Well, that's a Yeah. I, I, I told my friends I could get as good a firework to display as they can in Boston, which is saying quite a bit. Well, and to your point, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is a value about measures to reduce risk of wildfire. Right to Jeff's point, preservation and protection of the beach and other natural resources. I think that also goes back to the wildlife and just mm -hmm. all of those pieces that you know talk about community livability. Right, so I well, think that's what I'm hearing. Where I live, I get all of the noise, but none of the none of the oh, none no, of no. It. So there aren't a big draw. Yeah. <laughs> and that goes to volunteerism too. And I usually the day after the fourth, I go and you know. Trash, so. And the next one, trading for it's awesome. And about that, if you go and get a bag from them the day after, they will give you a free latte and a donut or whatever you want out of the pink. So, I you know, know it's a compromise. It's a good in both worlds. So, since, <laughs> since we're but, talking about fire, and, uh, I wanted to bend the South Beach Road Association a little bit here. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of the directors of whatever we're called. And uh, Judith's point about the, the trail at the top of South Beach going to Hearts Cove, for a long time, that was prohibited by the U.S. Forest Service. And they, somebody took down their sign, we tried to communicate with them. My, I think, you know, within reason, if there was some way to regulate it, people should be able to use that trail. The, the, the problem, the, the, the problem that exists is that people go up there and camp and they make fires. Yeah. And we, I think the summer before last, they, the fire department had to be called, called in and, and they spent took them all that of the day to yeah. put out a fire. This yeah. is, this is after the big, the big fire uh, break, you know, breakout yeah. after Labor Day two, three, two and a half years ago. Excellent. And so, you know, we're all thinking, and we see them go in front of our house walking up there, and they've got, yeah, they've got camping gear, you know, that they're walking up there, and, and so they're and, going past your private gate into South Beach yeah, and walking yeah, up, yeah. yeah. Private gates and other things, but <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's yeah. not publicly accessible. Yeah, that's so you know, to me, that's the, the that's the concern. I mean, listen, I've talked about this in the past. I if, if you live in this community, you should be able, and, and if you're a guest in this community, within reason, you should be able to take that trail. But somehow, it's got to be regulated because. We don't want to burn down that. She's going to regulate it. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's really it's, it's the Forest Service and Hellenic yeah, calls them. Yeah. All it's it's so We're trying to figure out a way to 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 do our own permitting system. Uh, if it, you know, if we could legally do that, mm -hmm. 
so that at least we have some control over that people understand the rules. Like don't don't go up there and spend you just go up there and spend the night, but don't go up there and spend the night and make buyers. No, no overnight. No. Well, <laughs> yeah. Maybe just a sign that says camping and buyers are prohibited. Well, I think yeah, those signs were there until they fell off. <laughs> Yeah, they were the U.S. Yeah, they never had signs. Yeah, they the U.S. Service had. They had a no no clothes sign, but I don't think they had signs. Oh, you're right. Yeah, just clothes. But but anyway, I mean that is a concern because there is another concern up there, and that there's a a, a huge uh, field where people will park to hike mm -hmm. up there, and it's privately owned. So I don't know. You know, but it concerns me that people park when the grass has grown up tall. And I guess we still have catalytic converters on cars that get hot and yeah. they can set fire to the grass. So I always worry about that when I see cars park there so, on a hot day. This is the discussion that we're having. And uh, we really don't want to prohibit <laughs> masculinians, that's the term I use, <laughs> from. Uh, Taking advantage of that trail, it's a it's a it's a wonderful trail, and now the the Forest Service trail at the top of uh, the summit of 101 is more or less closed. Washed, mm -hmm. washed then yeah. you, you know. So anyway, so oh, we digress. So values we can get out of that would be some way of regulating or at least. Uh, Encouraging it's safe access to yeah, and also fire safety. But you can't, but you can't do, we, we won't allow fireworks up there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know. that's a joke. That was a joke. Yeah, that But my question is, I mean, they have to go through the gate to get up there, so they do. yeah. So well, maybe they should have maybe change the channel more often. Well, there's you guys, that's about yeah, that's the fact that, that right. yeah, no, that's okay. the value for that. Okay, so I think we got that value that you'd like to have some security, some mm -hmm. limitation on people abusing, if I can use the term, mm -hmm. uh, the resources. Yeah. Mm. So we're talking about a friendly atmosphere. <laughs> okay, let's let's go on to one point. A place where children and their education are prized and the arts are encouraged. A place that is committed to preserving its village feel and special qualities through and then I'm not quite sure where that went. Uh, I quoted that out of the apparently but apparently that was in consensus. It, it, it's broken. Oh, uh, they're seeking opinions of others. Okay. Boy, I would have written that a whole time. That's a, that's a big, there's a lot in that statement. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's break it up. What about education and children? We don't have that many kids here that I see. Uh, we see we see people who come to the grandchildren, but in terms of residents, we don't, I don't see that many. I don't think I would not share it. I, I think this value is specifically speaking to the schools, but the school and most of the people who have their kids going there don't live inside the community boundaries. Right. They, and the school is outside of the um, unincorporated community boundaries yeah. for the community plan. Yeah, that's a little bit. That's more the discontinuity between what's officially Nesquid community boundary and what really is Nesquid. In my mind. But do you uh, know that... that we have had people who would well, you know, if it's it, not in the boundaries, it doesn't matter. Part of it. I, I know this is one of the great concerns and uh, uh, to again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that's true is that there are so many people who work in this community and the surrounding areas that cannot live here. Who are, who are principally, principally young people. Uh, you know, we maybe I should say this, but I, I will. Uh, I like I, I like to go to a good bar and I've lost or a good restaurant and I've lost well, I have a friend Wakey and bartenders, and we've lost a lot that including some that had to live in McMinnville but worked here. Or they lived in Newport or Lincoln City, and 
So we, we have to do something about affordable housing for those people throughout Tillamook County, but not, excuse me, unincorporated Tillamook County. Okay, maybe, go ahead, Liz. Well, I was just going to say, I think that maybe the biggest thing that needs to be because you hopefully you want kids living well excuse me i'm starting up the wrong way what we heard wednesday was a strong desire to see families living full-time in this community again and so when we start talking about the school children arts community livability and housing the school may be outside of the boundary, but ultimately, if, if you agree with the conversation that we had Wednesday night, you'd like to see kids here, right? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, and a good bartender. So what, what made this community attractive when I was a kid was um, being able to ride my bike everywhere and, and uh, I have no idea what the adults were doing. I have a few guesses, but, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., you know, uh, and everybody had our backs, you know, to the point where sometimes there'd be a call from the general store, you know, <laughs> to, um, did you know what they're doing, you know? So, I mean, just, and so that is, that's, that's safety. And that that's, that's streets where it's safe to walk and bike. So we talked about that. And the other thing is that I, I specifically brought my boys here to do soccer camps and um, to go to the Nesco and uh, the Summer Theater. So there were like three weeks and then there was the art, there was some art thing at the, before it was the cultural center. So they did art and they did theater and they did soccer camp here. I mean, not within the community boundary, but you know, and they made friends and I made friends. And so, um, I mean, since COVID, I don't know if that's what I don't have. Well, it's been golf awesome. The what camp? Golf camp. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And then the whole Boy Scout troop came and went to went to Camp Merriweather. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I got in trouble because they all camped in my yard. But the <laughs> point is that it was a friendly community, you know, for that. And so I think that uh, this statement doesn't really address that. You know, so community community activities that support kids, uh, kids activity. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there's two words in this um in the values here that I think that are important are are in a, in regards to children is play mm -hmm. and learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And safety. And safety. Yeah. Yeah. Who said that? Yeah. Um, so, okay, yeah. So I have so many thoughts about the big one um, start to organizing right now. But yeah, Nesquim Valley School needs a lot of support to continue on um, and exist. Um, so maybe bringing that more into the spotlight, spotlight of Nesquim and that's the golf course. No, we just had to this was spoken about last Wednesday. Um, a lot, yeah, we have a two year old, and we're one of the few families that do have a kid here. We've had to, um, it's, it's taken a lot of kind of struggle and effort and networking to actually live in Nesquim for the six or so years that we have because we were renters, we are renters, um, and we just could not afford any of the houses available to buy. So now we're actually building a house thankfully. But um so the housing is an issue for families mm -hmm. uh, with parents that work and we're raising a kid. Um housing for teachers needs to exist. Mm -hmm. Um you know ideally we aren't expecting teachers to come from far away to work at Nestle Valley School. Um and they're not paid a great deal, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, that's so that all that's all required for education to exist in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Is the school private or public? It's private. Mm -hmm. It's in um, okay. I think they scrap something. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I hear a couple of different ways of saying that affordable housing is a value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's at least three threads that I can unpack in here. There is nephew and being in place where families with children live year round and their children get their education. And I think we should like it could be a Nesmith Federal School, but like the public schools in this like, like that should be an equally uh yeah. pri like, like celebrated yeah. prize. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um and there's the sort of summer part that you were kind of referring to, mm -hmm. Kat, that that um Nestwin in the past, it sounds like it's been a destination where kids could mm -hmm. come for their summer vacation and have educational opportunities, mm -hmm. like, like not, not full-time residents, but as visitors. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the safety thing. So, so there's there's a lot going on here that, that, that we can kind of unpack and maybe like mm -hmm. uh, expose in, in values that, that make sure all those things um, are service. Well, the word that comes to mind is partnership. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, could could Nesquin be a partner with Nesquin Valley School for summer programs, for example? You know, I mean, you know, because it, it, I don't know how that would work, but you know, um, but like, like, you know, could more people know since there are no kids in the neighborhood? You know, could more people know so that their grandkids could participate? Well, they did the like, administrator over there. So yeah, yeah, that's a partnership. So partnership. I just just think there's a value of partnership with community resources, and um, and and Masaka would be one of them. That's when Valley School would be another one. The farmers market would be another one. Four uh, H. I know that Tillamook has Future Farmers of America. I mean, the center is simply a good place. To yeah, go. but I don't know what's going on there. They're, they're doing a lot of great stuff. Are and they're really reaching are, out to Are they reviving? Children. Yeah. They're reviving. Within the community, the, within the greater community. Okay, good. Yeah. So, you know, MBS, the National Valley School, receives money every year. I think it's been uh, support from the NCA here, the Community Association, and a lot of that money goes to support the mm -hmm. summer camps. There'll be summer camps again this year. Um, I think about six weeks, I can't remember because something like yeah. that. Uh, so there that's been an ongoing thing with the summer mm -hmm. camps and partly with the help of the NCA here in Nesquim. The other thing is that I can't, I'll just go back um, three and to Brian Doyle. I think our school actually made it into one of his books right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, because Brian Doyle used to, when he was here, hopefully you know who Brian Doyle was, but uh, He'd bring his kids out to school, play in the play area. And again, NDS is going to is going through a process of redoing all its play stuff and everything to make it possible for people to bring their kids out there again. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, lots going on there. Uh, but certainly the summer thing. My grandkids have all been to their summer programs uh, out there. It's been a lot of fun. So, yeah. okay. So, I think that summarizes. Does anybody have anything to add in terms of what to do? How does that fit in with the quiet? The kids are all going to be noisy, and the winter time is quiet time. Well, you keep the so kids off Slab Creek. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's valid. There, there's tension in some of these values. That's right. right. So. Well, that's where there's some people that are older that want it quiet, they don't yeah. want kids, and then there's one that wants to bring more kids and have fun, so well, it has to be a compromise. Leonard reminded me that I should have included teachers with Bart and there's some white teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of them. And doctors. And doctors. And, doctors. So, and firefighters. And they, 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 exactly. Yeah. But it's isn't there, there, is, there is affordable housing um, uh, like Lincoln City and those yeah. areas too, and, and a 10, 10 minute commute isn't bad. Like you're sure I'm used to the big city. Yeah, it's so, it, so it's not like it, this is just a community that's a little more expensive. So it doesn't have to be that way. Well, to have this atmosphere, it would have to kind of stay that way. Well, where we were talking about building, if you're going to have lower income housing, it's going to be apartments and condos, and that changes what we know. Anyway, we'll get into that discussion. That's a four of the discussion. I would say you can kind of have it both ways. Like, well, if you know, want to work, there is affordable housing. Ten, ten, minute, ten minute commute isn't bad, so it's not. It's not like saying there's no way to have teachers. It's like 
10 minutes drive is not bad. Okay, we'll, we'll approach that assumption later. Um, yeah. uh, we have to have, or my opinion is, as a resident in Nassau, we have to welcome anybody and everybody, encourage diversity of all sorts, economic, and we spoke a little bit on Wednesday. And so part of that is, let's not say, oh, you can just come to some other places. Let's make it possible for anyone who wants to live here to live here, especially if they're working here and contributing to our community in a valuable way. But are you talking about subsidized housing? Mm -hmm. No, 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 we're not necessarily. I'm not opposed to that. But I, I mean, I mean, so how would because so I don't, it's I don't know that that we, okay, it's not a bad thing. We're going to have to go to value. We talked about implementation. So I value having public investment affordable to teachers and firefighters and paramedics and park vendors in the cases. I have a value that um, that as a community that we um, encourage inclusion and and diversity and equity as a community. Yeah, I'm gonna try and prompt the discussion, and I don't know if I'm gonna be successful. Yeah. So there's a tension that. Well, the, the state law is going to require us to allow certain kinds of housing um, on the requirement uh, in, in certain situations, certain not. But, but there's also um, there's the there are practical considerations about where a developer can reasonably build. <laughs> housing that is affordable to more people. And I think just going like, oh, apartments, like we, like that's like, we don't want those. That 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 feels like you're you're like you're may, maybe there is a way we can talk about our values about what we want to preserve in the community while allowing change and growth in the housing stock, which like we're like I, I think we have to kind of accept that that's coming. Um, so, so, so maybe that's the discussion to have. What, what, what is important to us to preserve as more, like more people come to live in this? Hey, Tom. Hey, Sarah, I hate to put you on the spot. Yeah, please but, do. Sign here. But, but, but because you have a longer presentation than this, but could you give us a, a little bit of that presentation about what you think the the requirements and expectations of the state law uh the senate bill is sure and maybe maybe just enough to help us yeah. move forward because i know there's a lot of questions about this so taking a step back i think one of the most important pieces of this bill is it speaks to the point where it recognizes that apartments and larger development is not the answer it's not the answer everywhere. It's not the answer in smaller communities. It's not the answer where you don't have larger metro areas where you have, you know, abundance of water and sewer, you know, utility infrastructure, et cetera. What makes Senate Bill 406 meaningful and impactful in communities in Tillamook County is that it's up to four dwelling units. We're not talking about any more than four. And it doesn't mean that moving forward, every lot has to be able to build four units. What it means is that where these opportunities can exist because there is adequate land area, you could consider a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex or a small cottage cluster of up to four units. And the path to do that work is what is significant because it places this development opportunity on a path with clear and objective standards. So does that mean that you could go like four units on any zone property regardless of the zone? Residential zoning, yes. Residential zoning yes. only regardless right. if you want four, you can have. 
you can have up to four. Right. Right. Yeah. Up right. to four. Right. So, so again, like thinking about what are your lotting patterns of your area, you're not going to see fourplexes everywhere here. That's the reality. Are you going to see um, a duplex or a triplex tucked in? You know, the idea is it, it might, you know, it's going to look like a larger single family dwelling, but they still have to have parking. I still need a water and sewer letter. You know, all of those pieces are still with that development, but what it does is it takes that type of development out of a contentious arena. I don't know if you guys have ever paid attention to the letters that we get when someone wants to build a duplex. They're pretty disheartening, to be honest with you all. Um, and at the end of the day, I think there's a better way to look at a duplex or a triplex where there's adequate length, right? You got, you can't, you're not going to put a fourplex on a 25 foot by 100 foot lot. We all know that it's just not going to happen. Um, but can we create a clear path where with zoning and building? Yes, they have water. Yes, they have sewer. Yes, they have adequate parking. Yes, they're meeting your setbacks. Yes, they're meeting your building heights. That's the goal of 406. It's not to put in, you know, a bunch of apartments with that kind of cliched stereotype of low income subsidized housing, concrete boxes, you know, no landscaping. We know that's not what everybody wants where we will have flexibility and input in that section of this process is to talk about, should there be landscaping? What about stormwater retention, right? All of those things. Do we want to see pitched roofs? We can't create barriers, but what we're going to do is create a process where whether it's a single family dwelling, a duplex, triplex, or a fourplex, that the same process for that equitability, that including that diversity, that it is the same process for any type of those housing unit to be permitted. It's going to have to fit within the infrastructure too. <laughs> That's it, which is why the water and sewer letters, just like a house, if I don't get a water and sewer letter from the districts telling me that that service is available, we don't move forward with the permit. We can't. And this bill incentivize developers to build these units. It, there aren't, the second piece of the bill goes into housing production strategies. So where we already have those, Tillamook County is actually ahead of the game. We have the property tax exemption for up to 10 years. We've got the multifamily housing grant fund that comes from short-term rental operator license fees. That money could go to help offset SDCs, right? So, so we are working thoughtfully to try to help support all of the pieces that have to be a part of putting that development on the ground. Um, but the other thing, if you think about a lot of our local contractors and others, this is construction they do and they do well. They don't do apartments. They don't even, you know, when we think about our local workforce and supporting our contractors and our subcontractors, they are good at this type of construction. And this can pencil out, and this is a way for them to also put projects on the ground that they can do. And it could be have an exemption and rent limitations if they want to build it that way. It could be for doctors and middle management and others that are going to be part of that missing middle housing that make just enough to get them out of that realm of, a, of you know, a qualifying under workforce housing. So it's going to give us diversity in many ways, both in construction, in incomes, and accessibility. There's one more piece to maybe yeah. just quickly, Sarah, mm -hmm. connect the, the ADU legislation. Yeah. Two minutes. Sure. How sure. that adds to what you just said. Right. So we also have, so we have the accessory dwelling unit ordinance that's already available for your community. Right, so that's done. And then outside of your community in the rural residential zone areas, which includes areas like Slab Creek and others, I'm actually going through a hearings process now to allow accessory dwelling units on those properties outside. So there's no there's no magic bullet. What we're doing is you know literally taking a shotgun approach to say we want as many options and opportunities as we can in the toolbox because there's not one solution. There's not a good fit everywhere. 
But if we have different options, we're going to find a good fit with one of these options, whether it's an ADU, 406, or other things that we're working on. I'm not sure I understand the definition of ADU. Accessory dwelling unit time. Yes, I know, I know those words. So yeah. <laughs> it, what does um, that mean? It limits, so it's 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 like um, a mother-in-law apartment, granny flat. It limits the size of the unit. It has to be proportionate and then scale to the primary dwelling. It can't be bigger. Typically, you might see them with a one bedroom. They can be part of a remodel. They can be attached to a dwelling. They can be detached, um, but they're subordinate in size and um, they cannot be used for short-term rentals, right? Anywhere. Our accessory dwelling units cannot be used as transient mm -hmm. lodging. That even means for a bed and breakfast. And this work we're doing with Senate Bill 406 for the middle housing, it also will preserve the intent of housing to be for long-term rentals or individual ownership. Ah, okay. That's a nuance that I didn't yeah. get from that. Yeah. No, and that's, again, part of that presentation. But I just, we're not going to see fourplexes everywhere. We're what what our effort is it, the purpose of the effort is to provide as many options as possible, so that when someone wants to do something like this and they have a piece of property, they have options to see what can actually fit. So I just have a question about this um, four of six within the I, I'm assuming it just applies to the unincorporated community boundary, mm -hmm. the that implementation of it. So within that unincorporated community boundaries, we have. Um, sub villages that have HOAs. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's within the unincorporated community boundary, what happens if the people who own the empty lots, if no one wants to build these items, and then we wouldn't be, would we then not be in compliance? I mean, what is the motivation if people say, hey, I own an empty lot, but I don't want to go there, and therefore 406? Right. So you don't have to build a fourplex. You don't have to, if you want to build a single family dwelling on your property, you build a single family dwelling. If you want to build a duplex, I'm going to try to give you a clear path forward to be able to do that. So, so then if I'm understanding it correctly, it's just putting in place something if someone wants to build. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's an right. optional thing. Right. And to your point about CCNRs, you know, we can't do anything about that. They're civil. There's a totally different realm of civil enforcement for that. But again, it's it's our step. It's one of many steps to try to meet the housing needs of our communities that we know is prevalent and dire throughout Tillman County. So for me to establish better values for the communities, I think I need to understand how many new houses, homes, residences are needed in this area. Are we talking 20 new homes? We're talking 2,000 new homes. Mm -hmm. Because that changes everything. Is it a quota? Is there a quota? So we did have a housing needs assessment done in 2019. We have virtually no long-term rental stock. I can't remember what the number is of units that we need immediately to address our housing needs, but over the next 20 years countywide, just for people who want to live and work here, right? So the comp the competition in the market, people who are retiring, people that want a vacation home, a second home, and those are all good things. Those are all part of our community, right? We're not saying that those are bad, but when we look at the competitive market and we look at how many homes are going to be built, I believe in 20 years, after we dig ourselves out of the hole that we're in, we're looking at almost 2,500 units just for people who want to live here. In the entire town. Here. Correct. Okay. Yeah. What about just the next area? That I don't know. So um, like, yeah. like 30 to 40? Maybe. The yeah. big county. We are um, working on updating. We call it an HNA. I don't want to be bureaucratic and throw out a bunch of acronyms at you, but the housing needs assessment is the HNA. And we are looking at updating that. You know, one thing that was unique about that process that we did in 2019 was the creamery through care and Commissioner Scar, the, the direct executive director at the time, the creamery donated $70,000 to do a countywide comprehensive housing needs assessment because the only place by law that they are required are incorporated cities. 
But we had this stretch of 45 miles from Tillamook to Lincoln City. We had no idea what our housing needs were or how bad the situation was. So, you know, we were able to do that work because of that donation from the cream rate. And again, with the housing um, fund that we have that is supported by short-term rental operator license fees, we are taking those deeper dives again and really narrowing down. We're going to start that process this next fiscal year. So there will be more information coming, but it's a countywide issue that needs a countywide approach. Because for me, if, if we're only talking about a couple of fourplexes over the next 10 years, mm -hmm. that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And my value for how to keep this whole place very private and expensive. <laughs> that's so okay. You know what? You're not the only one that feels that, that way. But the thing is, is, a lot of it is the market as well. That's right. So how do you stay within what you know your values are? of being inclusive and kind and generous, but you're in a situation where the market is dictating a lot of what we're experiencing today. So that's where the housing production strategies will be very important. Yeah. And that's where the property tax exemption, the grant that we have through operator license fees. DEQ actually reached out to Tillamook County, the Department of Environmental Quality, they found out about the work that Tillamook County was doing to address housing. They're offering us a $3.6 million grant to use to help support workforce housing projects in Tillamook County. So we are actually, for being a small rural county, we're getting a lot of attention because nobody's doing what we're doing. They haven't figured it out. That's a DEQ. DEQ is giving us a $3.6 million grant. Wow. That's because we federal. are... We That's are bad. trying to make it work. Is that federal or state? It's state. Now, well, obviously, it trickles down. You know, I mean, yeah. it all comes from the top. But yes. yeah. So yeah, we're but so to your values, when you talk about inclusivity, inclusivity, equity, diversity, accessibility, you know, those values, we're we're trying to meet those values too, and and support everything that you guys are talking about today. You said that we are going to have an updated housing needs for our community. Do we have a current number? I don't know what NESCO one specifically is. I don't think we included the unincorporated communities in that housing needs assessment in 2019. I have to go back and look, okay. but I, I've made a note of that. Okay. And I'll fold that into the presentation. So I hope you're all here when I come back actually specifically to do that presentation in the future. I, I'm not clear on how much available land is actually within the community boundary that we're mm -hmm. speaking. I mean, so you're talking countywide. Yeah. We're we're talking yeah. within our community boundary. I mean, yeah. and services. How much outfit? Well, well yeah, but sewer. I mean, so yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, there's a lot across the street from us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm not aware of. I mean, I don't know. There might be some things up the hill, but I, there, there aren't there aren't tons, are there? I mean, well, can you speak more? To that? More to come. You got to come to the presentation. <laughs> I have no, I, this is the movie the trailer. Is the Huntsman thirty five acres that's for sale? Up, up, up. Is that a part of our our community boundary? One hundred and thirty. I think a portion of it. Is that is that what's called Cannery Hill? Oh, Cannery Hill. We're yeah. talking about it. Oh, yeah. So that's and across from Ore Town, kind yeah, of. That's a whole other conversation, Cat. That's is that, but is that part of our community? No, no it's no. not. No, but that's where there continues to be interest. And those of you who've been here a while, I'm not surprised by this. Mm -hmm. There's continued interest to put a planned destination resort up there, mm -hmm. which is a multi-million dollar commitment on a developer's part. Um, but nobody's been able to make that pencil out, but it's a revolving door in my office. But, but, that, but that's outside of our purview yeah. here. That's it my, is. is. Is Wyneema part of our, no. I mean, where does it We go as far as the how. Well, we as far that. as your membership boundary, though, yeah. it does extend beyond, oh, okay. which to the point of if and when I actually see an application come to fruition one day, I'm sure the community will want to be a part of that conversation. So okay. Did so, you say twenty five hundred or twenty five thousand? I think it's roughly twenty five hundred. 
2,500. Yeah. And that's not, that's not vacation homes. That's not retirement homes. Cause we're going to get all, there's a different need for all of that as well. So yes. when you add that all up, that's a lot of houses in 20 years. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Yes. More to come on that. I'm sorry, Tom. Thank you. Okay. So we sort of got sidetracked on that, but that really mm -hmm. speaks to our but values for yeah. how we want our community to mm -hmm. in the future. I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. One of the things that was sort of subtext that I uh, got from a lot of the conversations here was uh, infrastructure stability. I mean, it seems like roads and water available and all of that. Anybody like to speak to that? Well, the water district, uh, as required by law, just did a, uh, a study, a conservation study on how much, in a sense, how much water do we have <laughs> yet to give? Uh, I uh, and how much, what kind of things can we do to preserve, you know, or do water um, conservation? Uh, and as I think most people know, that the water district is in the process uh, because of the uh, board decision back several years ago to their owner control all of the, the land around its it, within its. It's called the source water area. That's where our drinking water comes from. Every stream, every little stream that contributes to our drinking water, that's continued, that's considered your source water area. And the water district board voted years ago to either own or control that so we can have protect our drinking water because a lot of things have happened, have happened in the past, uh, spraying by loggers, uh, landslides uh, because of or road uh, logging roads uh, causing landslides and and runoff from clear cut. We had to shut down the water. Uh, we just had actually just a month ago had to shut down the water for about three four days at the MK. So that's the strategy. Uh, so you can manage that land. The water district, therefore, the community would manage the land where its drinking water came from. So I uh, uploaded that conservation plan. Uh, to Jeff, where do we upload it to? The NCA? Not it's, it's on the resources CAC. page. It's on the resources page of the CAC, uh, CAC uh, as well as the uh, the sewer, the sanitation district. We asked to upload their strategic plan. That's also on the CAC resources page. If you want to take a look at that. Uh, one of the things about utilities and Sarah uh, can ultimately speak to this, but uh, for sewer, especially, uh, they're required to serve the community within its district, within the sanitation district. And if for some reason something happens and they don't have enough capacity, they have to build that capacity. Mm -hmm. Water is a little different in that we only have X amount of water. I mean, we can try to get secondary rights or drill wells or something like that. I mean, that would be a little more difficult, but. Um, so, and we talked about this at, the, at Wednesday night about the term adequate uh, yes. water and sanitation. And I think I've tried to make the case that adequate may not cut it as we move forward over the next 20 years, given climate change and other kinds of things that are happening already. So I think resilience, in my mind, that's how I see the water anyways. That's what the whole process of trying to own or control that land where our, our drinking water comes from. Um, and if you wonder why this, you can go up and down the county and then within our county and look at some of the issues, go to Rockaway, read the news at Rockaway about the struggles they've been having for the last 10 years to try to protect their drinking water. Uh, there's up and down the coast. It is, it is a common theme when communities, small communities like us get their drinking water that mostly comes out of industrial timber lands. Uh, so that's all of our struggle, and that's what we're trying to protect against and be more resilient. Okay, so, so uh, uh, I, I had a question for Sarah. What we just talked about really is beyond what is beyond our official borders affects us directly, but yet we don't have a, a voice that can talk to that. Is that true? So you have a value there. Yeah, right. we have the value. We have a value. Um, when it comes to Oregon Forest Practices Act and other things, your voice is limited. Right. So as the 
when we talked about it at the general meeting the other day, Guy and I talked about um, doing a presentation just on the role, like what the CAC can do outside of the land use realm and engagement and participation. Ran, I think you and I talked about that too. We'll do we'll do another presentation on that just so the community as a whole understands what the role of the CAC can be in those situations. But I think putting it in your values is important. You know, protection of natural resources, protection of your water sources. Mm -hmm. Nia Kani is very similar in that because they have a very similar situation. Nail, yeah. 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 So uh, what I want to bring back to is that although it may not translate directly into a goal, right? It may it would be available for other agencies to inspect us, mm -hmm. to inspect our values to be able to inform their decisions. That's right. So or if you get grant money or you're trying to leverage funds to buy land, like the you know, the the watershed, you can say in the Nescaline community plan, you can connect the dots back to, you know, this is a value of ours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's important to explain so that. Yeah. Sure. You might have something on doing Yeah, yeah. I was about to yeah, okay. trying to I, I I I cut you off, sorry. Well then Nancy would like to speak. Oh. We don't let Nancy speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> um, thank you, guys. I, you know, I'm I'm hearing kind of two conflicting values uh, with this discussion. I think it's a really important discussion with infrastructure and challenges regarding water, uh, sewer systems, et cetera, versus the need for more affordable housing um, and limited space to be able to build housing and. I, I'm trying to, I'm struggling, I guess, on how to frame that as a value, but I I kind of hear what you're saying, Guy, about having more robust infrastructure providing, but that also protects our nat natural resources. And so I, but I, I very much believe that there's a value of being able to keep excellent water and that kind of thing. But, but also I think some of our limits for being able to build reasonable housing can be uh, being able to have uh, you know, supportive uh, sewage and, and water systems as well. I don't know. Could you address some of that, Sarah? Is there a way that we could frame that as a as a value, or or am I just kind of not completely understanding um, no, the issues I, here? I think that what I think you brought up some excellent points. I think that is the work of this phase of this plan is how do we adequately, I don't like that word either, guys. Um, how do we adequately capture all of these values that ultimately reflect how the community feels that can best balance all of the important needs of, of Nescalin by way of natural resource protection, the balance of development with resources and capacity, protection of water quality, um, not only in terms of your community and preservation of wildlife, community health, but also in terms of your districts that are working hard to provide services. I think that's I think that's why this exercise is important is because we have to capture that. Yeah, I think a, a, a value that might very well be a good one to make the final cut is balancing growth and development with and resources or, or some services with the natural environment or the, like like that like balanced growth with this list of things. Part yeah, because we want it all. We want it all. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Part of the balance is automatic because if the services aren't there, if you can't right. get the letter that says you have water and sewer, you're balanced out and mm -hmm. cut out anyway. But we can put it in the value statement just to sort of like give us a little bit more. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, put put it put it more out of front. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, so Great. here's a value yeah. you know I have now that I'm officially retired, is that new development could bring new stresses to our infrastructure, which could result in additional costs translating to higher taxes. So, you know, I just can't go back to work to pay my taxes. So you know, I'm con I mean, I'm con I mean, certainly there's an inflationary thing that's going to happen, and that's planned for. But for instance, if there has to be a new sewer plant built, 
because of impending development, that's going to impact taxes. If there has to be new water resources developed, or if roads need to be expanded, you know, particularly like where our, our road is private, so the county doesn't even maintain our road. And so that all affects my bottom line and my ability to continue to live in this community. So, do you, I mean, so I guess I support a strong statement that you just said, but I something more strong than balance. You know, so we retired here because I value the way this community is. You know, I value the narrow streets. I value the wildlife. You know, I, you know, I even value the deer eaten by azaleas. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, we chose, you know, and I'll just be very vulnerable here. I have healed from cancer here. You know, I don't want to leave here. This is a very healing um, place for me, where my spirit is at home. And it, it's kind of frightening to me to think of what's coming down the road and that those of us who have our home, we've had a home here for more than 20 years, not always full time. But I, there are things that have been mentioned that I value here that I really don't want to change. Not that I don't want to include other people, but not if that means that my neighbor's gonna build you know, a stack and pack or that I'm gonna to have to, you know, um, widen the road, which at South Beach on Proposal Rock would mean I lose part of my front yard, but um, everybody seems to conveniently forget that because, you know, the road's just one, it's just one lane. So the easement is why. Well, it's what I'm hearing in terms so, of the value that I hadn't heard before was maintaining the level of affordability that's right now. That's yeah, well, yeah, I guess that, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I have a question, and maybe Zai to answer this this question, but it's my understanding that we have a limited water supply system in Nesco. Okay. And it's not going to get any Is that correct? Well, we yes, currently there is an option actually for the district to draw from Nesco or Slab Creek, um, and. Uh, it's something that hasn't come up because it's it would be almost impractical to figure out how to how to get water from Slab Creek to the water plant, and so you'd have to almost build another water plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is a there's potentially an option, uh, but you're right. We have a we have one creek. You got to all go up and visit the intake. You have this little stream going by, <laughs> this little intake, and you think well, all of Nest would be being fed by mm -hmm. this. Uh, it, it's incredible. Um, and that's why we're trying to protect it. Uh, and I said, a landslide wipes us out. I, I mean, we, we got what we got in the reservoirs. That's it. Uh, when we have a heavy rain and we have heavy sediment, we can't handle that in the, in the plant. So we have to shut it down. And I said, we shut down for about three days last month uh, after a heavy rain. So yeah, it's, it's limited. You know, Kat, too, one thing is uh, going back and Sarah remembers these days mm -hmm. when there was a plan, the technical term is plan unit development. And that means where you come up with a plan to stack a lot of houses within a small area and you get permission to do that if, if it's allowed within that zone, blah, 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 blah. So there was this proposal <laughs> for 125. Pardon? It ended up being 115. 115, it ended 115 homes across 101, where that wonderful art cottage work is. is um, cottage of the Nestwood. And one of the issues with that, among others, the fact that it was in the wetland, and people, a lot of people would send Sarah pictures of, of the land underwater yeah. where they were going to build the houses. But one of the issues was for the sewer district. Um, we thought we could handle it in the water district, but the sewer districts, and we'd have to go in upgrade because by law they had to upgrade yeah. and are they planning now i mean isn't there a plan to kind of upgrade the sanitary thing i mean that's it's in the strategic plan like we're all paying a few extra taxes now in order to do that right and you're going to be paying more water because we have remember we have a regional oh yeah water district that was formed out of 
four or five private I districts. I know the water's tripled in 20 years. Well, water. and those districts were built by developers, a lot of the infrastructure. Oh, yes, Mr. Fultz. So you're going to have to, one of the things the water district is looking at, what the cost is going to be when those systems need major repair. So, yes, you're going to, you're right about that. And I think Tom identifying people, you wonder how many full time people here are actually working full time and not retired. And so it's the retiree on fixed income like us, you know, fixed income people and your costs keep going up. Um, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? No, that's an underlying. And we I mean, have had periods in Nesquim when we were a well on water. We've had yeah. times when we were asked by the water district mm -hmm. to come in the water ring, not wash car and stuff like that. End of August, first part of September. And in the 70s, we had to boil water for those who have been around that long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. for water. Mm -hmm. And t-shirts. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to go in. Water. <laughs> <laughs> there is one. <laughs> so we're, <clears throat> we're through the list, and I asked you to think about well, no, there's this a place that is committed to preserving its village feel and special qualities through seeking opinions of the permanent and an intermittent res residents and then conveying those opinions collectively, <laughs> democratically to the county and state agencies, as well as all individuals thinking about becoming a part of the community in the future. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> that, that one needs some work. <laughs> yeah. 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 I wanted to skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. We what can. haven't we covered? I mean, we cut, we uncovered a, a value in affordability, I mean, maintaining at least being able to stay here, not being able to do it. I, I would like to see language like prioritize um, the preservation of natural resources mm -hmm. over development. You know, I, so, so I like that better than balance because, you know, that's kind of subjective, but prioritizing. So, I mean, if the water district can't handle development, if the sewer can't handle development, if the roads can't handle development, then the development shouldn't happen. I'm well, sorry, but it, that, you know, it, so. It, it won't happen. Yeah. Okay. Those are, those are, well, it'll happen slowly. They're, they're infrastructure constraints here that don't allow for rapid growth. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there won't be growth. I mean, there's, there's a difference for being here today as opposed to mm -hmm. 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I agree with that. I like to prioritize that over development too. Yeah, and so, yeah. So, so that those things, because I, as a retiree, I don't want to be in a position where I'm having to pay for that development. You see what you understand what I'm saying? Whereas, you know, so developers gonna come in, get a 10-year tax break and all kinds of other perks, and I'm gonna be stuck paying the bill. I I can't I I appreciate what you're saying. I I don't think that that will ultimately be the scenario. And I think maybe some deeper education and information about how that actually works with water and sewer districts as well, SDCs, where money goes. You know, um, directly related, you're talking about road systems. So I think there's, I appreciate your concerns, but I think that there is a bigger picture here mm -hmm. and that that will be part of what we'll discuss later too. That's, that's, those are valid concerns, but I I, mm -hmm. I think that it it's not, it shouldn't be done. And maybe that's what we're asking for is what is that bigger picture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what sure. Is, what is the intensity of development we've been talking about? Right. If we're not talking about much, mm -hmm. so we have very little, you know, very few mm -hmm. concerns, and everything we're doing will set it for another twenty years. Mm -hmm. But it's a lower level of concern, mm -hmm. and it will work. Right. right. And if so, we're concerned about mm -hmm. two thousand units going in, just yeah. in this area, I mean, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. So the so value is being aware awesome. of what the community directions are. Yeah. What the restraints are. Exactly. And that is, I have several pages of notes today just of everything that you've said yes. as far as those values go. In my mind, thinking about those next steps ahead, how I put those in. 
and how I address those. So I appreciate all of the feedback that I do. Well, and aren't there places in the county, like vacant, like large parcels of land with, that could be like $115, 115 units, like you talked about, you know, aren't, aren't there places, like I just drove up to Garibaldi yesterday and, you know, I, I was amazed at how much rural land there is. So, I mean, that's county, right? It's not, it's not Nesquan. Mm -hmm. But it, and I mean, not very far. I mean, just go out Highway 18 a little bit. It's all about the zone. It's oh, it is. Zoning. Right. Yeah. And, the, and the availability of water. Like, mm -hmm. So, like most of our, I think it's 95% or more of our county is zoned resource. It's farm and forest. So, you're right. There are land, large land areas available, but they cannot be developed. Mm -hmm. They're for cows. They're for cows and trees, which isn't a bad thing either. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, but no, that'll be part of the why. Why can't we do this in these other areas? To your point, there are very few pieces countywide. There are. Really. There are very few. I can, for that type of development, I can probably list five. So then, how, the then the issue is how do we comply with Senate Bill 406? Which right. is why it's up to four units. And it's not bigger is because of that reason. We know that those larger developments are not conducive to our county as a whole. There's very limited places where they can be, but it's not everywhere. Okay. So we have this huge thing where we have 95% of the land in, in fields and forests. That's right. And they and are locked up have, by the state. Yeah. And then we have 5% roughly of the land. That includes that, your cities. Exactly. So now you're talking, once you overlay the cost of everything and try to be inclusive and affordable, it doesn't go together. We've got competing needs. Yep. Mm -hmm. There you go. Which is why the values and the vision statements are critically important to the work we do moving forward. To prioritize things. That's right. To get them to happen. Yeah. 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 I've, I've heard you say during previous uh, talks that the number of residences that we have within the unincorporated Nesco and community boundary is likely about 900. Yeah. Would we want to possibly think about in the same way that there's going to be a cap, there is a cap on STRs as far as development? Because if we are currently at 90, whatever it is, 905, 908 residents. Sorry, those are properties. Those are properties. Property. Those are not residences. Those are just lots, lots, lots of parcels. Some with houses, some without. That's right. So nine hundred and eight lots within our community boundary. Mm -hmm. um, if we might want to consider like capping the development in the same way we're capping STRs. So how you? So I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the word cap, Susan. I appreciate what you're saying, but what yeah. we're talking about is thoughtful and managed growth. Mm -hmm. And you do that by lot size. You do that by setbacks. You do that by your water and sewer letters. There's, those are those are really important pieces. So when we get to the ordinance element of this process, those are the things that we'll be talking about and seeing. But the 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 trick is when we get there, and just to prepare everyone, we cannot differentiate in those conversations between a single family dwelling, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex. They will all be reviewed the same way, just like a stick belt house and a manufactured dwelling. They will all be reviewed the same way. Of the 908 lots, how many do not have property houses or some type of so unit? It's not in my GIS work. That's a great okay. question. So, yes, just part of that will be the no, that's that's part of the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. as we work together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've always understood the 908 to be. Improved properties above fifty thousand is that not right? Um, is that a difference? So the condos are a part of that. Are you thinking of the short term rental board order? Are you, well, yeah. I, I've heard you. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So but I've heard you define improved properties as improved. By I guess in relation to the real the real property by fifty thousand dollars in terms of the exercise to try to identify how many properties are developed, but no, that's just yeah we're doing the okay. homework we're doing the research now because I do want to be able to come back with the best data. Um, okay. We I got 
um, a GIS data analyst through the contract, which I'm super excited about. So all of this work is on that that task list too. Yeah, it's my homework. <laughs> to, to follow on some of from what um, Sarah just said, like to, to frame like what, what we're trying to do here. Um, our ability with this community plan to affect like the total number of houses that are or, or, or development that like the total amount of development that happens in Nesquin is pretty limited. So like if, if we're if, if we're focused on that, we're, we're kind of we're kind of like a we're missing the opportunity that the community plan gives us, which is to try and influence the quality of our neighborhoods mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, like a, a bunch of us live up on South Beach Road towards the top. There's empty lots all over the place up there. There's still more empty lots than there are houses. Do you think oh, that's right? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so like we, like Tom, Tom, me, like we all like have a, an interest in like, seeing that those lots are filled in a way that like makes our neighborhood nice like in, 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 in a way that like we're happy with it. And I think that's the opportunity that the community plan provides us. Like like it's it's not, I think it's a great opportunity to kind of use the value statement to say things about the water district and say things that like that kind of express their opinion about development and things like that. But 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 that stuff is is happening at a much bigger level that we have only a little bit of influence over. So so yeah, I say pick the battle that we're where where we do have some. Mm -hmm. So do we have some uh comments from the yeah. Let's see. Nick, I think do you have another one, Nancy? Oh I do. Use... I do. I've been waiting for a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I've been sorry. I've been uh listening though, and I, I guess I'm gonna just throw out some questions on whether anyone cares about this kind of a value, but um I, I'm hearing about people who are retired and living on a fixed income and all of that, but uh, having tourism, you know, this is a, a recreational area, uh, the coast, and is there a value about having, um, providing an environment for others to enjoy the beach and the ocean uh, and the economic benefits of having people come in and enjoying the beach and the ocean for Nescoin and for the county to enhance the economic uh, area as well. But, you know, I grew up uh, coming to Nescoen, uh since the 1950s and it's a big part of my childhood. And uh, we brought our son here. Uh, so I don't live there. I'm not a resident, but um, I absolutely love Nescoen and the feeling. And it, it was just a big part of my growing up. And I think that was probably true for a lot of the people in this room and people out in Zoom land. Um, so, I, I, I hear us getting a little hung up, I think, on on limiting, and I, I certainly understand limiting big development, definitely, but uh, and also being very, very careful of our resources. But do we want to say anything about allowing others to share the incredible beauty of the ocean and the beach and and the community feel that is Nesco in, in a way that still protects that community feel, um, small village feel? So I don't know how to frame that in a I'll have to think about whether I can submit something, but think about how, how to write that. But I, I, I haven't heard it mentioned before. Thank you, Nancy. Will you write that down and send me an email? <laughs> if I can remember it, Tom, sure. <laughs> well, it's, it's sharing. And I think that, that that is reflected in in the communities we have, like Pacific Sands, the Chalan, Chalan you know, proposal rock condos the uh, short-term rentals that are permitted in the community are all opportunities to share an mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, Nancy, to your point, you know, I mean, my parents rented a place in Nesquin for 21 years. And every summer they dragged us around and looked at houses and they were five and $7,000. And my dad said, that's too much. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> So, I mean, I I experienced Nesquin as a child and I my parents were short-term renters. So, of course, I want to make that opportunity available. So, I, I don't want it to go away. I wish the wayside had more parking, but that's a state issue, right? 
Yeah, that's outside of our purview. But if we put that in a value yeah. of adequate parking for guests and visitors, <laughs> that, yeah. that 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 okay. is a yeah. legitimate value. And that's a legitimate, yeah. yeah let's 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 yeah. do that. Adequate parking for guests and visitors. We value that. But if you build it, they will come. I know. Yeah. 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 Where yeah. Where yeah. One of uh, my issues, I guess, is that, and unfortunately, I live here in the village, and I feel very fortunate for that. But the village part of Neskowin is what bears the burden of all of the people who come to visit Neskowin. Yeah. South Beach Part doesn't because yeah. they have yeah. a gate. We, we have lots of SDR. North Neskowin North doesn't. Yeah, you have a, a huge problem with SDR. Yeah. North Beach doesn't because they have a gate, but you know, you know the, the gate doesn't really keep people uh, away. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying is that, that when people come down to spend a day at the beach, mm -hmm. yeah, it's all right here. Yes, it is. It's where the, the water is. Yeah, Sorry. I mean yeah. the ocean. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and then so no parking. We're beginning to, to run out of time. Well, so adding parking only adds to the numbers of people. That come here, which I already find to be burdens. Yeah. Okay, so a value is, yeah. which is not necessarily, we don't have to have all these values of mm -hmm. So a value is maintaining a, a reasonable level of visitation. I can ask a question about the process. Is there a moment where we prioritize these values if some are competing in nature? What we're doing right now is essentially brainstorming. Right. And our very easy job is to take these four hours of conversations and put them into a coherent list of things that we that we think would be values. Then these values then will codify them. I'll figure out some way of getting feedback on them and try to gauge the relative importance. So all of those things are very, very difficult. And uh, part of the committee is, is, is meant to uh, to distill these values. Uh, my job as an editor is to try to make that make sure that that's a clear communication, uh, and we'll assign values up to the values as much as we can. Uh, I don't know that re anything would be eliminated, but if there is a big negative, if we reduce straw polls. In terms of uh, evaluating these, maybe there'll be something that drops off. Don't know. Uh, can't predict that. And we'll be doing this through next month, uh, and then bringing those to uh, public at the May 26 meeting of the NCA at the fire hall, just for a, a bit of a straw poll there, but. Even when we get into the implementing ordinances, we may have to develop values because of a need for a value to drive recommendations. So the process isn't going to like end and that's all you get. It's going to be continuous feedback. And we're that's our job is to keep the number one state planning goal is public participation. So that's our priority is keep this dialogue going. And as we distill these things, we present them back to you. And then you go, well, that's not what we said, or, you know, whatever. We're, we're going to get, you know, tomatoes, eggs, all kinds of things thrown at us. And will we distill? So it's a it's a long process. Tom's going to have six iterations for every Oh, that's value. nothing. Hurt my uh, loss. He loves that. <laughs> uh, but go ahead, Lori. But um, having said that, that this could be distilled over the, the summer, we're hoping that the values and visions are clear that old ones and new ones that we want to present by the end of May, because the summer is going to be full with the practical things like potholes and schools and housing and all those things and all those practical things build on the values and visions. So this, this if you care about the essence of the core of Nesquin, this month is really important. The others, it's kind of nuts and bolts. You might want to come to the one about water, but not the one about streets or whatever. But now is when we're really getting the basis for what we really are as a community. Mm -hmm. And on the, the list there, the handout list, it gives our next meetings. And we're hoping at the end of those meetings, 
um, in May, which is, looks like a lot of them, but we're just going to be refining what we've been talking about the last two meetings. We're hoping to come up with a real list that you could say, yeah, that's what we added and that's what we agreed to from the original ones. Um, so depending on how your brain works, if your brains is more like potholes, you really want to pay attention a little bit later. But if your brain is like, what do we really believe in? Now is the time. <laughs> Let us know. And we just went over the existing values. We still want to bring up some new ideas that will drive new values. So today is a way to get this into your system, but we want you to digest it and come back or write us. You can write us things. You don't have to wait for a meeting. You could tell us things through uh, uh, at at the info at uh, well, you want to, to say community value yeah. or anything to tag it for you, but we we want to hear, get your input in any means that we can in this upfront time so that we can put the include those things in the values that we bring on the 26th of May. So I hope you'll continue to attend either in live or on Zoom participate in this meeting so that we get your ideas. Uh, uh, excuse me, is the handout available for people on Zoom with the dates? Because I haven't seen anything. The dates are all going to be under the events. Um, I, I don't see them. Well, the, um, I haven't seen that handout either, but the, we'll make sure that, that anything, that all meetings are well noticed. So let's read what they are. Can you read what they are? The meeting. Here. Thank you. So the next meeting is Wednesday, May 7th. And we're going to try and limit it to May seven. Did I say this seven? I heard you did. Did I have it wrong? I'm sorry. No, it's it's because 7 p.m. is right next to it. I, I guess I'm dyslexic. I never knew that. Wednesday, May 2nd, 7 p.m. to 8.30 in person and Zoom. Here at the clubhouse. And then May 4th, two days later, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. here at the clubhouse and on Zoom. May 16th, 7 to 8.30 in person in Zoom. Saturday, May 18th, that's going to be Zoom only. And Saturday, May 26th, 4 p.m at the NCA general meeting in person only at the Nesquin Fire Hall, where we'll give a summary of what we've distilled to date. And we'll have a straw poll of some kind at that point in time to get some feedback from the 100 plus people there. Did yes, you say, Tom. Did you say, I'm looking at this, did you say Saturday, May the 18th and Saturday, May the 26th? Because if you did, that's impossible. It's going to be an impossible week, apparently. <laughs> it's an it's printed. Correct. Jeff will correct it. Jeff will correct it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's Sunday at the fire. Oh, okay. So it's it should be right. Sorry. It's Sunday. Yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Sorry. That's Memorial Day. Yeah. 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 But the NCA meeting, so right. it'll be when yeah. the NCA right. meeting gets started. Right. So, so we are out of time. So okay, thank you all very much, and uh, we will get all these notifications on the website, and uh, hopefully see you again in May. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Nice, Missy. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and,